The stars are brightly shining It is the night of our dear Savior's birth Long lay the world in sin and error pining Till he appeared and the soul of felt its worth a thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder breaks A new and glorious morn Fall on your knees For hear the angel voices Oh no So, all right, Luke chapter 2, let me get there first before we read it. I probably should be there. Um, <clears throat> I got this verse, a verse that's been, it's, it's a, <clears throat> a verse that's been, I've been just been chewing on it all week, actually the last couple of weeks, because you, know, you start thinking about Christmas, you know, and Christmas message, and this verse is very familiar, but let me read this whole passage for you, if I can. Luke chapter 2, I'm going to start in verse 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us, go, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. I, I wrote this in the margin of my Bible. It says they returned. I have that word returned in verse 20 underlined. It says returned to being shepherds, the same, but different. They were different after that night, I guarantee you. I want to draw your attention. Here's the verse that has been in my mind that I'm going to take apart this morning. We're just going to look at, okay? I don't want to say dissect it, but just look at verse 12 again. It says, this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Have you ever noticed that God rarely gave a sign when somebody asked him for one. People are always asking Jesus for a sign. He says a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign. But God gave signs. But it was always his idea. Um, in fact, he, he scolded people for asking sometimes. When God gave signs, it was always to increase somebody's faith. It was never, to, it was never as an answer to unbelief. You might say, well, what's the difference? Well, God only gave signs to those who were looking Looking for him, not necessarily looking for answers. Okay, here's my title. Okay, then we're going to talk about this. He said, this will be a sign unto you. All right. <laughs> Remember, who was it? Was it Jeff Foxworthy? Here's your sign. Was it, no, who was it? Yeah, Bill. Bill? Bill who? Angel. It was one of those guys. <laughs> one of those guys. Here, he said, here's your sign. Right? That's the title. Here's your sign. All right, let's pray. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you bless this time right now. Lord, thank you for, Lord, I don't know how this is going to come off, but Lord, thank you for just the glimpses I catch of you and that we can catch of you just even in this verse. God, some things that maybe sometimes we kind of lose sight of. God, I thank you, God, for this time of year when we can commemorate, Lord, we can remember Lord, we're, we can see some things about you that if we're not careful, we'll forget. So God, again, we just commit this time now in your hands. I ask you to use it in a powerful way. Lord, help us. Lord, I pray that you will give us what we need. Lord, I pray that you will bless your people, that you'll feed us, but Lord, that you'll visit us in a special way. So God, again, we just commit this time into your hands and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice, first of all, I want you to notice the announcement, okay? Now, this is actually kind of an introductory point, but I, I, you know, we've heard this story our whole lives, and sometimes we just kind of, I don't know if we ever really think about it. Now, I like to talk about it just about every year because I find this scene so remarkable. I cannot imagine, nah, I guess I can. <laughs> oh, this is a stupid illustration. These guys were shepherds. Shepherds. I can't imagine that that was a really exciting job most of the time. They were out there at night watching the sheep. It's kind of like working in the tower. <laughs> working at the prison in the tower. Now where Greg worked, working in the tower was kind of prestigious. Where I worked, it was punishment. They sent you to the tower because we had a 40-foot wall, the prison I worked at. You ever tried to climb a 40-foot wall unnoticed? It's impossible. All right? Even when you're sleeping, 
you're going to catch somebody trying to climb over the wall. <laughs> there was a lot. You'd have to get creative out of trying to stay awake. Now, you'd sit there and you'd, you'd think about, you know, you'd check your weapons. You know, we had a shotgun and a rifle up there, a Mini-14 and an 870 shotgun. We'd have them, so you'd check them, you know. You'd be looking and you'd be watching and, you know, every once in a while. But it was, it was boring. Now, I know shepherds. Every once in a while, they'd have to do something, you know, scare off a wolf or whatever it was that would come around. But for the most part, it was boring. And I bet you this was, night was no different. All of a sudden, boom! Angels. Okay? It says they were sore afraid. Yeah, that would freak you out. But God visited these guys. God visited these guys and gave them this announcement. That is awesome. Just regular, hard-working folks. Somebody called off that day. And he missed it. <laughs> You know, but how God would give that announcement and, and, and trust that stuff, this, I mean, nothing, there's no other announcement ever in the history of ever was bigger than this. And who'd he give it to? He didn't give it to the king. He didn't give it to politicians. He didn't give it to religious leaders. He gave it to a bunch of shepherds. That's awesome. It kind of reminds me of the Bible talks about the treasure that we hold in earthen vessels. I, you, you know that they were thinking, Lord, why, why us? Why us? Why did you visit us? You ever feel that way about you and the Lord and about why, why would God save somebody like me? Why me? I, 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 love, I, love, this, I love this story. But, okay, let me get into the message. Just this verse right here, there are seven things that we can learn about God in just this verse. Number one, God's accessible. Look at, look at the verse again. It says, and this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find. Ye shall find. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 23, 23 says, I am, a, am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? He said, I'm not far off. He said, I'm a, guy, I'm a God that's near. <laughs> He's accessible. He said, you're going to find him. He said, ye shall find. He said, that should be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe. Isn't it cool? Just because religion will tell us that God's distant and that we've somehow got to gain his attention or his favor. But God says, no, I'm not a God that's far off. He said, you already think about this. God wants to be with us more than we could ever want to be with him. He's nigh unto us, the Bible says. He's nigh unto us. We shall find if we search for him. He said, just look my way. Said, the Bible says, draw, draw nigh unto God, and he shall draw nigh unto you. You shall find, if we put in any kind of effort at all. Now, the shepherds needed to go in that direction. They needed to go, or else they weren't going to find it. But he said, you'll find if you go. He's accessible. Number two, God's appealing. You shall find the babe. <laughs> Does the thought of, of seeking an almighty God coming into his presence, wouldn't that scare you? If, he was to, if they were to say, we want you to go, if you go into Jerusalem or into Bethlehem, I'm sorry, if you go into Bethlehem, you're going to find God. You're going to find almighty God. Be like, um, I'm not in really no hurry to go in there and face, stand face to face with God. Remember God told Moses, and these guys probably were aware of that. God says, no, no man can see me and live. It's like, no, that's scary. A baby's not scary. God showed himself. When God appeared to him for the first time, when he was there, like in the flesh, literally, God in the flesh, he came as a baby. Just, it's kind of hard to be scared of a baby. Now, okay. I remember my first baby, Karina. Want to hold your baby? Uh -huh. I don't want to break her. 
She's so tiny and delicate. And I'm still a little scared of whole newborns. You know, I've only dropped a couple. <laughs> dropped Riley on her head a couple times. <laughs> no, I haven't. But it's kind of hard to be scared of a baby. <laughs> but I wrote this down. God, the creator of the universe, showed up as a baby. Everybody loves babies. God is appealing. There's an appealing. He's like, I'm not here to hurt you. We forget that. We lose sight of that, 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 that God is gentle. You've heard me quote this before, and I've never read the book. Maybe someday I should. Um, Lying the Witch in the Wardrobe. And I think the introduction at one point where they find out that Aslan is a lion, then they said, a lion? Is he safe? And whoever it was that was telling about it says, no, he's not safe. He's a lion. He's not safe. But he's good. I'm told that the word God comes from the old Anglo-Saxon word good. That his characteristic is the fact that God is good. <laughs> he's, he's appealing. Again, it's hard to be scared of a baby. Number three, he's approachable. <laughs> Not only was it a baby, but he was in swaddling clothes. Now that kind of brings with it just kind of commoner. It wasn't like he wasn't in royal, a royal onesie. He was in swaddling clothes. Deity clothed in humility. He was approachable. Not somebody that was, a, he didn't come as somebody that was above us. In, in fact, if anything, he came like those, somebody that would come beneath us. Approachable by anybody. Uh, not just a baby, but a peasant baby. An approachable God. That's awesome. You know what? There's something about our flesh that rebels against that. You know, the devil's always on our back and our flesh telling us, no, God, God's angry with us. God, you know, we, we can't approach God. But the truth is, he wants us to approach him. He came as a baby for crying out loud. He called a bunch of stinky, rotten shepherds to come. Those guys weren't religious. They weren't necessarily good guys. I'm not saying they were bad. We don't know anything about them except they were just shepherds. He called them into that holy place to approach God in the flesh. The first people that showed up to that worship service was just regular folks. Because we have an approachable God. That's awesome. Number four. <laughs> it says, find the babe in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Number four, it's a, he's amazingly accepting. <laughs> In a manger, okay, you know this already, and you've heard me say this before, but God not, was born in a barn. Yeah, I remember as a kid, I remember, you know, coming in the house or whatever, and you leave the front door open, and you say, shut the door. You're born in a barn? I wonder if Mary ever said that. <laughs> Matter of fact, it was. <laughs> But he was not just born in a barn, but he was laid in a manger, in a, I guess it's a feeding trough. Okay, walking in there. Now, this was actually the sign, you know, because that's not something you see every day. Jim, you ever gone up to the barn and seen somebody laying a baby in there? No, not. <laughs> I should have specified. Yes, I should have specified. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> nope, not a human baby. So, I mean, that's not something you'd see every day. All right? But it's like, yeah, I, I love this because a lot of times we, we, we see this and we see all the, you know, we see the live nativities and we see the plays and we see the different things. And it almost comes off like Jesus being born in this stable, that that was plan B. That it was like, you know, like Joseph 
forgot to make reservations somewhere or it was like it was just because there was no room in the inn. Well, yeah, that's how it played out, but it was plan A all the time. It wasn't, okay, we don't have no place else. God made it that way. And one of the reasons why, well, not only for this reason, but also I, I love the picture of this. I love the fact that, okay, it, this is what, it, this, it didn't happen like this. Okay. All right, well, I guess if there's no room in the inn, we should have, we should have planned this out, um, but we didn't. So, you know, here's all the angels taking care of all this. Okay, we got to get in here and clean this place up because it smells like crap, literally. All right, we got to get this place cleaned up because God's moving in here for a few days. So we got to do this. We got to get this place all cleaned up and we got to make this look like a nice little church. You know, we've got to get this place all cleaned up and tidy and perfect. No. It was a barn. It was still a stable. It stunk and they went in there and did it. And I love the picture because now all of a sudden you've got Jesus inside this rotten, nasty barn. It's just like us. There was a day, almost 50 years ago, when Jesus moved into this stinky, nasty barn. He didn't ask me to clean it up first. Okay, he'd take care of cleaning it up. You see, you understand that when he moved in there, it was no longer, people didn't see it as a barn anymore. It became a temple. When those shepherds came in there, when they came and they saw him, they weren't looking at the fact that it was a barn. I'm sure they noticed but what they came there to see was Jesus. That, that, that barn became a temple, a place of worship, because now all of a sudden, here's God. He was the focus of it. God didn't ask me to clean up first before he could move in. And I love that picture. And it just reminds us how accepting God is. He's like, look, do you understand that this, none of this, I don't care how clean you could get this, it would still be filthy. The Bible says that our own righteousnesses are as filthy rags before God. The best that we can do is still filthy before God. So none of that matters. What matters is Him and the fact that God loves us enough and that He's accepting enough that where He still moves in, that, that song, we'll probably even close with it, that song, Just As I Am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. <laughs> That's awesome. That God is that accepting of us. That you say, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know what it's like in here. God already knows. And he still wants to move in. Now, he's going to change you. He's going to rearrange the furniture. <laughs> you know, he's going to clean you up from the inside out. But the fact is, you don't have to do it first. He doesn't expect that. He's amazingly accepting Number five, the other thing that comes to my mind when you just, this whole scene is one of love, and I put this word in there, agape. You see agape. You see God loving us. You see God loving us, undeservedly loving us, unconditionally loving us, unimaginably loving us. That God himself, we know how this thing plays out, right? We know why he came, and the reason why Jesus came was to to die for us, right? That's unbelievable that God... Okay. Try to imagine you being God for a minute. You created these people. You created Adam and Eve, and, and you made everything perfect for them, and then they rebelled against you. You told them one thing. I gave you one thing not to do. And you did it. I would have been very, very tempted to just wipe them out and start over. I mean, literally. Literally. Why not? He didn't owe, him, owe them anything. He didn't owe us anything. And, and, and the people that rejected him all those years and just going on, just things getting worse and worse and worse, and God shows up to redeem them, to give himself for it. It's like, that's... How do you describe that kind of love? Every sin I've ever committed has been against God. And he still loves us. <sighs> Somebody once said, and I believe it, if, if you were the only sinner on the face of the earth, Jesus would have still died. Undeservedly, unconditionally, unimaginably. There's another word that comes to my mind when I think of this whole scenario here. <laughs> okay. Every once in a while, 
more often than I'd like to admit, because I do like to alliterate my points and make them all start with the same letter. Sometimes I'll have a word in my head, but it doesn't start with that letter. So I have to go to a thesaurus and I find a word that matches up with this. And the word I was looking up was miraculous. But you know one of the suggested words was, I said, I've got to find a word that starts with A that means miraculous. <laughs> the word was absurd. And it reminded me of a story I'll read in a second. But <laughs> let, me, let me just read you what I wrote down here. <laughs> At least one of the shepherds must have... It must have had this thought or something near to it. What in the world is going on here? This is crazy. You know, just take a minute and just kind of hit your breath, take a step back and go, this is unbelievable. This is, this is nuts. And it reminds me that God doesn't usually make sense to us. God says that at different times in the Old Testament. He says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. He said, as high as the heavens is above the earth. He says, so how much higher are my thoughts and my ways? Stop trying to figure me out. I'm not going to make sense to you. You can't figure me out. God doesn't often make sense. A lot of times we get frustrated with God because he doesn't think like we do. That's a blessing. God doesn't think like we do. <clears throat> okay, let me, but let me read this to you. I love this. I remember reading this in Max Lucado's book, uh, God Came Near. And I can so relate to this conversation. <clears throat> give you a little lead up to it. Uh, Max was with a fella in a church and he had done a series of talks and Max was in the student at this time and this is what he witnessed at the end of one of these times where people were given, had a question and answer time. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> you mean to tell me God became a baby? The one posing the questions was puzzled. His thick eyebrows furrowed in doubt and his eyes squinted in caution. Though there, were, uh, though there were places to sit, he opted not to do so. He preferred to stand safely behind the crowd, unsure yet intrigued by what he was hearing. Throughout the lecture, he had listened intently, occasionally uncrossing his arms to stroke his whiskered chin. Now, however, he stood upright, punching the air with his finger as he queried, and that he was born in a sheep stable? He looked as though he'd walked down from one of the adjacent Colorado mountains, stocking hat, down vest, uh, nylon leggings, hiking boots, and he sounded as though he honestly didn't know if the story he was hearing was a mountain legend or the gospel truth. Yes, that's, that's what I mean to say, the lecturer responded. Then the fella went on and he said, and then, after becoming a baby, he was raised in a blue-collar home, and he never wrote any book or held any offices, yet he called himself the Son of God? That's right. The lecturer being questioned was Landon Saunders, the voice of the Heartbeat radio program. I've never heard anyone tell the story of the Nazarene like Landon can. And then the fellow went on, he says, he, he never traveled outside of his own country nor studied at a university, never lived in a palace, and yet asked to be regarded as the creator of the universe? That's correct. I was a bit unnerved by the dialogue. I was fresh out of college, gung-ho, enthusiastic as a volunteer helper in the lecture series. I had come with memorized verses and responses loaded in the chamber of my evangelistic six-shooter. However, I came prepared to defend a lifestyle and not a savior. I was ready to argue morality, doctrine, heaven and hell. I wasn't ready to argue a man. Jesus had always been someone I just accepted. These questions were a bit too aggressive for my virgin faith. The fellow went on and he said, In this crucifixion story, he was betrayed by his own people. No followers came to his defense. And then he was executed like a common junkyard thief. The lecturer said, yeah, that's the gist of it. The authenticity of the questioner didn't allow you to regard him as a cynic or to dismiss him as a show-off. To the contrary, he seemed nervous about commanding such attention. His... His awkwardness betrayed his inexperience in public speaking, but his desire to know was just an ounce or two heavier than his discomfort. So he continued. And after the killing, he was buried in a borrowed grave? Yes, he had no grave of his own, nor money with which to purchase one. 
Boy, the honesty of this dialogue kept the audience spellbound. I realized I was witnessing one of those rare moments when two people were willing to question the holy. Here are two men standing on opposite sides of a deep chasm, one asking the other if the bridge that stretched between them could actually be trusted. There was a hint of emotion in the student's voice as he carefully worded the next question. And according to what's written, after three days in the grave, he was resurrected and made appearances to over 500 people. Yes. And all this was to prove that God still loves his people and provides a way for us to return to him? Right. <laughs> Max says, I, I knew which question was coming next. Everyone in the room knew it. It could have gone without being asked. And in my heart of hearts, I was hoping it wouldn't be asked. <laughs> the guy said, doesn't that all sound rather... He paused a second, searching for the right adjective. Doesn't that all sound rather absurd? All the heads turned in perfect sync and looked at Landon. All the heads, that is, except mine. My head was spinning as I was forced to look at Jesus from a new angle. Christianity, absurd? Jesus on a cross, absurd? The incarnation, absurd? The resurrection, absurd? My Sunday school Jesus had been taken down from the flannel board. Landon's response was simple. Yes. <laughs> yes, I suppose it does sound absurd. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> I didn't like that answer. I didn't like it at all. Tell the fellow how it made sense. Diagram the dispensations. Present fulfilled pro prophecies. Explain the fulfillment of the Old Testament, of the law, the covenant, the reconciliation, the redemption. Sure, it made sense. Don't let him describe God's actions as absurd. Then it began to dawn on me. What God did make sense... It makes sense that Jesus would be our sacrifice because a sacrifice was needed to justify man's presence before God. It makes sense that, that God would use the old law to tutor Israel for, on their need for grace. It makes sense that Jesus would be our high priest. What God did make sense. It can be taught, charted, and put in books on systematic theology. However, why God did it is absolutely absurd. When one leaves the method and examines the motive, the carefully stacked blocks of logic begin to tumble. That type of love isn't logical. It can't be neatly outlined in a sermon or explained in a term paper. Think about it. For thousands of years, using his wit and charm, man had tried to be friends with God, and for thousands of years, he'd let God down more than he lifted him up. He'd done the very thing he promised he'd never do. It was a fiasco. Even the holiest of our heroes sometimes forgot whose side they were on. Some of the scenarios in the Bible look more like the adventures of Sinbad the Sailor than stories for vacation Bible school. Remember these guys? Aaron, right-hand man to Moses, witness to the plagues, member of the Red Sea Riverbed Expedition, the holy priest of God. But if he was so saintly, what is he doing leading the Israelites' fireside aerobics in front of a golden calf? Sons of Jacob, the fathers of the tribes of Israel, great-grandsons of Abraham. You know, if they were so special, why were they gagging their younger brother and sending him to Egypt? David, the man after God's own heart, the king's king, the giant slayer and songwriter. He's also the guy whose glasses got steamy as a result of a bath on a roof. Unfortunately, the water wasn't his, nor was the woman he was watching. And Samson, swooning on Delilah's couch, drunk on wine, perfume, and soft lights. He's thinking, she's putting on something more comfortable. She's thinking, I know I put those shears here somewhere. Adam, adorned in fig leaves and stains of forbidden fruit. Moses throwing both a staff and a temper tantrum. King Saul looking into a crystal ball for the will of God. Noah drunk and naked in his own tent. And these are the chosen ones of God. This is the royal lineage of the king. These are the ones who are to carry out God's mission. <laughs> it's easy to see the absurdity. Why didn't he give up? Why didn't he let the globe spin off its axis? 
Even after generations of people had spit in his face, he still loved him. After a nation of chosen ones had stripped him naked and ripped his incarnated flesh, he still died for him. And even today, after billions have chosen to prostitute themselves before the pimps of power, fame, and wealth, he still waits for them. It's inexplicable. It doesn't have a drop of logic nor a thread of, a thread of rationality. And yet, it is that very irrationality that gives the gospel its greatest defense, for only God could love like that. I don't know what happened to that inquisitive fellow in Colorado. He disappear, disappeared as quickly as he came, but I'm in his debt. He forced me to see Jesus as I'd never seen him before. How absurd to think that such nobility would go to such poverty to share such a treasure with such thankless souls. But he did. In fact, the only thing more absurd than the gift is our stubborn unwillingness to receive it. <laughs> There's no way to describe what God... Why? There's no answer to the why. There's one more thing. <laughs> if you were listening to me quote the verse, you'd notice that I kept leaving out a word. And this is kind of a word that I thought was, I thought, huh. Been chewing on this one especially. And that's, let me, here, look at the verse with me. Verse 12. It says, and this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe, what's the next word? Wrapped. <laughs> my wife's been doing a lot of wrapping this week. Huh? I appreciate you wrapping my toilet paper. That was awesome. Wrapping my toilet paper in toilet paper. That would have been. <laughs> um, kind of like a present. They found the baby wrapped. God's gift to us. Let me read you some verses that I'm sure you're familiar with. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15 says, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. <laughs> this is about the simplest illustration you've ever heard, but it's, it works. It's fitting. This idea of being saved, of what Jesus did for us, and the fact that it was all grace, for by grace, just that word, man, you can preach a message on grace. Maybe I should sometime. I probably already have. <laughs> on grace, this idea of unmerited favor, how it's something that we absolutely cannot earn, and it's almost... It's, no, it's, it's not almost. It is, it's absolutely, uh, what's the word? Uh, we're spitting in God's face when we think we can. We think we can earn his, his grace or his favor. Unmerited favor. It's something that, that we cannot earn. And he says, I'm offering it to you as a gift. Okay. Come Christmas. Here we got Christmas coming up. Can be giving our grandkids presents. Way too many. <laughs> you give them a present? What if they were to say, I mean, how would you feel if you were to offer, let's see here, sheep? <laughs> I'll, I'll do the donkey. <laughs> I'll do sheep. If I was to say, you know, Len, I want you to have these nice sheep. Here you go, or I wrap them all up. I should, I should just use the paper and wrap them up. Go here. You'd be like, no, no, I don't want it. You don't? I could see Killian do that. No, no, I don't want it. <laughs> okay, well, it's not, okay, uh, I'll just keep it then. Or if you were to offer them a present and they just ignore it. Or they say, oh, maybe, I'll, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll take it later. You say, well, that, that wouldn't be very... You know, spent all that money on that thing and they just kind of don't really care. 
think about the price that was paid for our souls and how people just, some people reject it, some people just put it off, some people ignore it. You see, a gift, in order for it to be a gift, has to be received. That's it. The thing that makes it a gift is the fact that you, somebody's giving it to you freely, and that's a gift. If it wasn't that way, if I was going to say, you know, do this for me and I'll give you this, that's payment. But it's a gift. And it's a gift and it has to be received. There it is. I'm all done. Let me ask you a question. Have you received that gift? Has there ever come a time when you have received what Jesus did for you on the cross? The Bible says, For as many as received Him, to them gave He power to be the, become the sons of God. If you have, let me ask you this. It doesn't stop there. And this is the way I wrote it down. Are you willing to receive all that He has for you now? It says, This shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Father, God, thank you, Lord, again, for loving us. Thank you, God, for just, Lord, so much stuff in your word, Lord, just reminders, Lord, of places where we catch glimpses of you. <sighs> and, Lord, we are so, I am so easily distracted. And, Lord, I have to be reminded of these things. Lord, sometimes I feel like, I, Lord, when I'm kind of doing my own thing and then, I glance your way and then I feel pretty uh, wicked and Lord, which because I am, but Lord, I'm, but then there's that part of me that creeps in that thinks that you're distant and that you're angry and that I somehow got to be good before you love me again. Lord, none of that's true. Lord, thank you, God, for loving us in spite of us. Lord, thank you for the fact that you, if it wasn't for you, God, what you did for us, Lord, it, it's all you. Lord, we would be absolutely hopeless and helpless and on our way to hell. God, thank you for Jesus. With our heads bowed, not exactly sure how to do this. Maybe there was, God's really good at this. God's way better at this than I am. <clears throat> Maybe there was something. Maybe God put his finger on something in your heart and life. Or maybe it was just a, you know, maybe maybe you're discouraged. Maybe kind of your vision of God has been a little clouded or whatever it is. You say, you know what? Lord put his finger on something. and I need prayer. God spoke to me. I need prayer. Pray for me. Pray for me. Yes, 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 yes. Pray for me. Yes. Pray for me. One more question. If you died today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? I want you to think about that for a second. Okay, I'm not doing this to scare anybody, but at the same time, this is what I do. Okay, this is what I'm here for. All right, this is, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um... I'm, I'm hoping everybody's going to be okay through this, but you know what? One of these days you're going to die, and it's a fact. Um, are you ready? Do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? There's no shame in admitting that you're not sure. Matter of fact, every one of us had to come to that place at one time or other. If you're not sure with nobody looking, okay, this is just between you, me, and God. I'm not going to point you out or anything. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to slip your hand up and put it right back down and say, pray for me. i, I got to be honest, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Pray for me. Pray for me that I get this thing settled. Pray for me. Father, again, Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. Lord, I pray now that you'll bless these closing moments in Jesus' name.